Hello, everyone. Welcome to Unlocking JavaScript V8 on Risk Five. My name is Bryce Dobry from Futureway Technologies, and my boss Peng Wu will be joining me for the Q&A session uh, after this video. So I'd like to start off by introducing the V8 Risk Five core team. As I mentioned, I'm from Futureway. We have three engineers from the software lab at Futureway working on this project. Um, all of us bring a compiler background, but none of us have previous experience with V8 or Risk Five. Um, back in January, we were interested in contributing something to the Risk Five ecosystem, and found that uh, this V8 was a good target, um, and it, no one seemed to be working on it yet. So we started this uh, joint effort with Rios Lab to, to get started. Um, I think probably many of you have heard of Rios Lab before, but I'll, I'll read this sentence from their webpage to kind of give an explanation of what they are. So, founded in 2019 as part of the Tsinghua Berkeley Shenzhen Institute, the Risk Five International Open Source Laboratory began its journey of bringing the research effort of RISC-V CPU with its software and hardware ecosystems from UC Berkeley to the rest of the world. So we've got uh, four team members from Rios that are working with us on this effort, and the partnership has been uh, fantastic so far. Uh, once we open source, we realized that there was another group working on V8, and that was the PLCT lab, the programming language and compilation techniques from uh, it's associated with the Institute of Software at the Chinese Academy of Sciences. So um, they were working on a port. Uh, we had kind of been coming at it from different angles. So we reached out to them and uh, decided to partner up. And it's been a really excellent, productive partnership. Um, the PLCT lab also does some other work related to RISC-V, including working on vector extension in LLVM, um, new features for Spike, and new RISC-V SOC for, uh, on QMU. So they currently have four staff and three interns working on this V8 project with us. So the question then is um, why V8? So V8 is a JavaScript engine. Um, and JavaScript, it seems to me, is one of the biggest missing pieces from the current RISC-V software ecosystem. Um, so as we know, JavaScript is absolutely necessary for today's websites. Um, it's what enables all the dynamic functionality on these modern websites. and um, a little research uh, on Wikipedia shows that about two thirds of browser usage comes from Chromium based browsers. So that includes not only Chrome, but also other browsers like Vivaldi, Brave, uh, Microsoft Edge, uh, all use this Chromium uh, as, as their core. And so that covers the front end, but then also on the back end of the web, the uh, Node.js has become incredibly popular. Um, it's used to power uh, the back end of the websites. And um, that's not only by you know, little pet projects, but also big companies like Netflix, eBay, Amazon, Reddit, PayPal, they're all using Node.js in some way, some way or another too. Um, it, it seems like tens of thousands of websites and web apps are using it. So V8 is the JavaScript engine that powers all of that. Um, and, and also I haven't mentioned WebAssembly yet, but WebAssembly is a relatively new um, technology that I think has got a whole lot of potential. Um, and V8 is a really powerful way to enable WebAssembly as well. So this kind of clarifies, yes, V8 is definitely an important uh, addition. So uh, it's something we definitely like to try to help out with. So um, a bit of an intro about V8 itself. It's written primarily in C++. It's about 2 million lines of code. Most of that is C++. Uh, some of it, a decent chunk is also JavaScript. And then there's various other languages mixed in there. Um, it's a very well-engineered, mature code base. So uh, it's, it's a really nice ecosystem to work in. I, I know kind of getting started in a big project, big existing project can sometimes be a terrible experience. Um, I won't name any names, but several projects I've worked in before are not so friendly. Um, but the, the um, design and architecture behind V8 is really nice to get started working in. Um, they do a really nice job of containing all the target specific code and uh, keeping most of the code target independent. So bringing in a new backend, it makes it very clear where we need to make changes. They are currently targeting x86, ARM, MIPS, PowerPC, and S390, and soon uh, RISC-V. Uh, they have a really thorough testing suite, which has everything from tiny little assembler tests that run just a few machine instructions up to large benchmarks. Uh, for example, there's one called Poplar that is a PDF rendering application that's written in C++, but compiled into WebAssembly and then used as a uh, test case in their suite. So our goals for this uh, task, uh, for this effort, are to build a functional and performant RISC-V backend for V8. <clears throat> 
So we, we, we set some minimum requirements for RISC-V in order to be able to run this V8. And we went with the RV64G uh, general purpose uh, base instruction set. So that's the uh, integer operations, multiplication, division, atomics, single and double precision floating points, control and status registers, and memory fence. Um, all of those get used by the core functionality inside of V8. Um, the initial target hardware is the Hi5 Unleashed board from Sci5. So that's the Freedom U540 SOC. And we're using the Fedora Developer Rawhide as the OS. Um, in the future, there will be additional optional um, improvements if you have the extensions uh, C for compact instructions, B for bit manipulation, J for dynamically translated languages, which uh, that one is, seems very interesting. I just learned about it when creating this slide, um, but I'll be interested to, to learn more about that. Uh, P for packed SIMD instructions and V for vector instructions. So those will be optional, and if you have them, they will enable additional optimizations. So now let's take a look at a bit of the architecture behind V8 so we understand what we're getting into here. Um, in this picture, I'm showing uh, JavaScript, it can get interpreted by this ignition engine on the top and um, JIT compiled by the TurboFan compiler. At the same time, WebAssembly um, can get quickly ahead of time compiled by the liftoff um, engine and JIT compiled by the TurboFan uh, optimizing compiler. So liftoff is a, a baseline compiler and TurboFan is the optimizing compiler. So that's the big, you know, SSA form, lots of optimizations, LLVM-like compiler that generates the high performance code. Um, liftoff is very quick code generation just to optimize the startup time. And um, it, so that, that's the main goal. Uh, basically when, because WebAssembly is the common scenario, hence the name is, is using on the web, it actually starts compiling even while the module is still streaming in from a download. And it, it does code generation while it's decoding and validating a function body. Um, so on the, on the left-hand side, the JavaScript path, the interpreter is used initially for speed and then hot functions get uh, optimized by the TurboFan compiler. And on the WebAssembly side, uh, all functions first are compiled quickly by liftoff and then in the background compiled by TurboFan. So there's several reasons for that difference, um, but among them is the fact that for JavaScript, because it's dynamically typed, uh, you really need to, to run, to execute a few times to discover the types to allow you to do more optimizations in the code, whereas WebAssembly is already strongly typed. So we can do that optimized build uh, right away. Another interesting point is that the higher level, uh, the fast uh, interpreter and compiler actually used the TurboFan macro assembler API, which I'll, I'll get I'll mention some more details about later, but they use that um, to generate, um, like for instance, the ignition um, uses the turbo assembler API to generate bytecode handlers for each opcode. And those are compiled ahead of time during the V8 build. So um, there, there is a correlation there. And we end up with ignition being a very fast interpreter in our experience. Um, so next I'd like to talk you through our strategy a bit. Um, as I mentioned, we didn't have any previous experience, experience with V8. So we decided to start with an existing target um, and MIPS is a close enough of a target and we did have some familiarity with that architecture already. So our goal is to take the MIPS V8 uh, backend and from that build the RISC-V V8 backend. So the, the first phase, which I, I call the RISC-V in name only or the Rhino phase, so um, this looks kind of silly and oversimplified, but it really did work well and help us to get bootstrapped very quickly. Um, so basically what I'm showing here in this, in this terminal is uh, essentially just finding all of the MIPS64 specific code in V8, copying it to a new directory called RISC-V. So um, basically just taking the MIPS backend and renaming it RISC-V and getting that, having something working that we can build and run. Um, it's, it seems, like I said, it seems kind of silly, but it really does help to get started and just have something running right away. Um, and it's not quite as simple as just copying those directories. There are also um, target independent files, which have some if defs inside of them for different architectures. So we also went through, found all the MIPS 64 um, targets, uh, the MIPS 64 uh, specific code inside those files and, and added a 
duplicate of that for risk five. Um, so in this Rhino instance, it looks like if, if you call it, it looks like you're attempting to generate risk five, but it actually is only generating MIPS code. Um, so the other benefits with this, besides just giving us something that actually builds quickly and can have like a starting point for how to attack this thing, it also gives us a good way to identify where are all the places for the target specific code. Um, and then we also get to know the architecture a bit better. So as you can see here, the, the target specific code is nicely organized into these directories and, and there's a minimal amount that's mixed into the independent files. So um, as we went through that phase, uh, we learned a lot more about the architecture. So what I'm showing here are some of the different uh, intermediate representations that are used inside of the V8 compiler. Uh, the ignition IR, that's the, the uh, interpreter. It's very high level semantics. Then and TurboFan has several levels of IRs that go from the highest JavaScript operator levels down to something very close to the machine. Um, <clears throat> and then we have the turbo assembler, which is machine specific, and it's um, not mapping directly to hardware, but it's it's a lot it's getting a lot closer to the machine. And then when we go down to the assembler API, now each of these is mapping directly to one machine instruction. So this is kind of the hierarchy that we need to attack. Um, so two options: we can either start from the top and work our way down, or start from the bottom and work our way up. Um, I, I suppose you could try to go middle out if you wanted to, but um, we, we decided to go for bottom up. Um, if, if you try to do top down, then you'd be starting at those high level machine specific interfaces, customizing them for risk five. But the problem is that you won't actually be able to execute anything and test it until you've worked your way down through the whole stack. So if we go bottom up, then we, we finish the lowest level first and we can start running uh, tests and executing things. And then we'll work our way up from there. So that covers the assembler piece of it. Um, as I said, we start off by generating RISC-V assembly binary for MIPS instructions. Uh, but then at the same time, we also are working on the simulator. So uh, V8 has this embedded simulator, which enables us to execute those RISC-V instructions generated by V8 on our x86 development platforms. So this is um, different from say Spike, like we're not actually generating an executable, a RISC-V executable and running it in Spike. This is generating those instructions within uh, V8. So I have this picture kind of here. So running on x86, this is the V8 uh, process. This is TurboFan is generating RISC-V instructions, and then we're running them inside that process on this embedded RISC-V simulator. So this simulator proves to be extremely valuable for um, speed in our development. Um, it enables us to start working before we had access to hardware. And it has a lot of really nice tracing and debugging features that would be more difficult to, to access if you're running on real hardware. Um, so because of the granularity of their testing system with V8, uh, just having this set up, we can start running a whole suite of tests that are basically testing those lowest level interfaces. So they're, they're running you know, tens of instructions at a time. Um, a little just look at the uh, the assembler here. So this is an example of the APIs that we're in, that we're implementing at this early phase. Uh, for example, we have an add instruction here. It has the destination register and two source registers, and then we're passing it to this function that we wrote to uh, to actually generate the binary. And then kind of the opposite of that. So here we're doing assembly in the simulator. We're doing the disassembly, and we are detecting the add opcode, and then using that extracting the, the bits and you know, retrieving the source registers, adding them together, writing them to the destination register. So we went through this process, starting with the basic integer arithmetic instructions and work our way up from there, um, working through the test suite of assembly tests. Uh, and, and basically once we could get all those working, then we can move up to the next level. But the changes were gradual. So there will be a time when we're generating code that has a mix of both MIPS and RISC-V instructions. And um, when it's a mix, it probably will not run successfully on the simulator unless the simulator is somehow able to detect a, a, a MIPS instruction versus a RISC-V instruction. But eventually we get, we get that whole bottom level complete and then we can start to execute everything successfully on the simulator. So the next phase, so now we have this kind of functional uh, phase two, but we wanna to move to a more optimal version. So we're going from the horse to the, the V8 engine. Um, 
the we basically just continue to move up, redesigning and re-optimizing those higher levels of abstraction. Um, it's suboptimal because at the higher levels, there are places that are generating still what would be an optimal sequence of instructions or operations for MIPS, but they're not the optimal sequence for RISC-V. So um, it's a process to go through and, and, and map those to better sequences for RISC-V. So this phase is still in progress now. Um, so now I want to give a little bit of a demo. Uh, the first demo is going to be running on the simulator, and I'm going to show you CC test, which is the those low-level tests that I was talking about. Um, this example that I'm showing here, uh, we don't have to understand the whole thing, but these two instructions are what we're actually testing here. So we've got an add instruction and a JR, which is uh, this is basically a return instruction. So um, we're calling, we're we're generating a function, and we're calling it with a, B, zero, and C, and then adding them together. So our expected result is A, B, C. So I'm going to go ahead and run this in the simulator in this demo video. Oops. Start the video. Um, OK, so I'm going to run CC test with this trace sim option, which tells the simulator to dump out all the instructions as it simulates them. So here we see the add instruction, we see the return, and we see that the result of the add instruction is A, B, C, as we expected and it's in register A0, so that's gonna be the return value for that function. So that, that test ran successfully. Um, next, I'm gonna run D8, which is a debug shell that's, that uh, builds when we build V8, and allows us to run JavaScript in this shell, in kind of, sort of a REPL situation. Um, so I can run any JavaScript code in here, and it will execute, and I can uh, see the output. So here, uh, undefined is because print is, is, is returns an undefined. Um, we interestingly we can also use D8 with that same trace sim flag. Um, so if I use it to do something like print hello world, we'll see all the instructions that get executed for that hello world um, statement. So lots of instructions. Hello world always seems like it should be simple, but it's always a lot of instructions. So um, everything works well in the simulator. So next, um, I haven't talked any more about Node.js yet, but because we now have this ported VM, or sorry, ported V8, um, we're also able to build Node.js for RISC-V. And it works basically with just some changes to the build system to support that RISC-V cross-compile. Um, that work was all done by my colleague, Jahan, from the PLCT lab, um, as well as recording the demo that I'm about to show. So thank you very much, Jahan. Um, this, uh, what I'm showing here is the, the package file for the, an NPM a node module. Uh, we've got the interesting part here, I guess, is just the, the fact that it, it is pulling in some standard uh, modules, Express and Body Parser. And then this is the application on the right here. So we can see it's basically just a web server that is, um, if you do a get on Slash, it sends you a form. And then it handles with a post to submit, it's handling the processing of that form. And then it just prints out something using the, the fields from that form. So let's go to the video and we can watch Jahan run this. So he shows us that he's running on the RV64G platform. This is the sci-fi board I mentioned before. Um, he runs npm install. And uh, I think the packages are already, are already downloaded here, but we see that that's successful. And then he starts the application. <clears throat> and we see that it's running on port 8884. So he switches to the browser and pulls up that web page. We got the form, he puts in his name, and there we go. So uh, everything works. That's pretty awesome. Um, Node is working, V8 working, NPM is working. It's, it's all very exciting. At the time of this recording, those changes that Yahan made to Node.js are not yet published in our V8 RISC-V GitHub organization. But um, hopefully by the time you see this, it should be. And we will work with the, the Node community to get those changes upstream as well. So as far as testing status, um, we are currently running over 17,000 or approximately 17,000 tests, and we only have tens of unexpected failures. I didn't want to put exact numbers in here because it will be different by the time you actually watch this video. Uh, but we're running on both the debug and the release builds, and we're running in default mode and stress testing mode. And then we're also running all these tests on the simulator, uh, QEMU, and also the High 5 Unleashed board. Um, and they all get pretty much all the same errors. There, there are a couple of differences between those three, but um, 
they're all at about 99% uh, as compared to ARM. So we're using ARM as our comparison because it's closer to RISC-V than x86, but it is also still a, a top priority backend that's maintained by Google's V18. So we're using that as our, kind of our gold standard for what, what tests should pass. Um, and again, these are tests, everything from the lowest level assembly tests that run just a couple instructions up to those big applications like the PDF renderer I mentioned. Um, uh, basically, we, we've just continued our work to go through triaging these failures, uh, opening issues for them and, and resolving them. And it's, it's been going really well. So we also have the Node.js tests, which I think there's about 3,000 of those. And we only are seeing 13 failures right now. We'll be working through those. That number may be down to zero by the time you watch this. And then we also started running some JavaScript benchmarks as well. So SunSpider runs successfully, Kraken runs successfully, and Octane, um, we, we're, we're currently hitting an error with that, but we will continue to work on that one. Um, we don't want to report any performance numbers yet for those benchmarks because um, we're still in the mostly just functional V8 right now. Um, once we finish some more optimization work, then we will start to publish uh, benchmark performance numbers. So um, some lessons learned. I realized I didn't have any charts yet, so I wanted to just make one up for this slide. Um, basically, our model of, of starting with the existing backend, MIPS64, implementing that Rhino method, uh, it worked really well to bootstrap the whole process and enable testing very quickly. Um, then the next big, big step is the simulator. So that embedded simulator is extremely valuable for improving our development time, like at least 2x faster. Um, and not only is it, is it, was it fast in enabling our development, but it also proved to, to provide good results. So when we switched, when we started trying to execute on real hardware, we were passing about 99% of the tests on the simulator. And immediately we passed about 65% of the tests on the hardware. Um, but then even more exciting than that is after just a couple of days, we got that, that hardware number up to 99% as well. So there was just a few bugs that we ran into where we weren't modeling something correctly in the simulator. So one of the bugs was um, related to the sign extension of 32-bit instructions. And another one was related to NAND boxing and single precision floating point. So quickly, we have parity pretty much in the, um, the simulator and the hardware. And then the third big step is open sourcing and building a community and really growing. Um, it's been going really well, and I hope to, to continue building that community. Um, so kind of to summarize the project, we open sourced in July. This is our GitHub page. Uh, so far, as of this recording, we've got about 300 plus commits from 10 committers. Uh, we've got a variety of documentation up on our GitHub page uh, in the wiki to help with onboarding new developers. We've got issue tracking, we've got milestones, we've got roadmaps. We're trying to keep nicely organized so that the open sourcing can work well. Uh, we've got a Slack community and we've got a biweekly community meeting. Um, and we are discussing uh, upstreaming with V8. We've been in touch with them and we should be merging soon. Possibly by the time you watch this, it will already be merged upstream. That'd be great. So uh, roadmap, uh, what's coming next? Uh, so phase one is very close to completion. Uh, that's getting the functional backend working in the simulator. And then phase two was getting the functional backend working natively. Uh, that turned out to be much simpler than we thought. So that one is also very close to completion. And then uh, phase three is the enhancements phase. So um, that should be interesting and fun fun work. So like uh, up till now we've been doing porting and bug fixing, but phase three is more performance analysis and, and actual new development. So there should be some interesting work there. Um, as I said, sometime soon, if, if, this, if it hasn't already happened by the time you see this, we will push our changes upstream to the core V8 project, and then we'll continue working with both the V8 community and the RISC-V community. Um, so if this sounds interesting to you, please reach out to us and get in touch, and we would love to have you join, join our community and, and help out. So I'd like to say a big thanks to um, everyone who has contributed so far. So this list is all of our collaborators, uh, committers, Slack community members and V8 developers that chatted with us and helped us out. So I hope I didn't miss anyone, but thank you very much to everyone who's been working on this project and continues to work on this project. So that's it for my talk. Um, this is a link to our wiki page, which is kind of the best getting started place if you're interested in using our V8 port or if you're interested in joining us, um, check it out.
Thank you very much.